Hello everyone and welcome to Montreal webinar series on SharePoint for Pharma. Today's webinar will be on leveraging your ETMF documents to automate clinical processes using SharePoint. My name is Frederick Landry and I'll be uh, presenting for you today. So before we start, uh, what is SharePoint for Pharma series? First, it's, it's a series of informative webinar that aims to showcase different applications of SharePoint 2010 for the life sciences. It should provide you with a good grounding on how SharePoint can be used for regulated activities. Of course, slides can be distributed upon request. We'll be providing details on how to request slides at the end of the webinar. And feel free to ask any questions you may have to the questions panel, and thank you for your interest. Before we get uh, into the uh, core of the subject. First, I'd like to ask a few questions that we'll answer together. First, what is the uh, TMF? What are some of the main TMF issues today? What is an ETMF? What TMF limitations can be addressed through an ETMF? And I'll provide you with a few do's and don'ts for those of you who might be initiating an ETMF effort. So first, what's the difference between a TMF and an ETMF? So the definition of a trial master file of TMF is paper or a combination of paper and electronic documents that individually and collectively permit evaluation of the conduct of a study and the quality of the data produced. These documents serve to demonstrate the compliance of the investigator, sponsor, monitor with the standards of GCP and with all applicable regulatory requirements. And what is an electronic trial mass file then? Well, it's essentially, it serves essentially the same purpose, but it is, it is exclusively based on electronic documents, so there will not be any types of uh, paper records that will be used. Now, even though the trial master file and the electronic trial master files have essentially very similar definitions, because the electronic trial master file is built of electronic documents, it will give you a lot of other uh, options and insight into your operation we'll, that we'll uh, look at a little bit together. Uh, what are the classic TMF issues um, people are usually faced with? First, in terms of quality, it's difficult to control what actually goes in your TMF. You will also encounter post-its, irrelevant documents, duplicates. Uh, there's, a, there's also a significant part of the TMF that is email correspondence, which makes it very hard to manage. In terms of completeness and reconciliation, while well, due to the volume and complexity, it is extremely time-consuming to assess what is present and what is not. So it is never possible to say with absolute certainty the TMF is 80% complete. In terms of storage and accessibility, well, for a single study, a paper TMF represents a large volume of binders and boxes, and they all must be stored in a single physical location, which makes accessing the documents and accessing also the information, of course, very challenging for some people, depending on where you are situated in the company. Now, is the ETMF a silver bullet? Well, if we look in terms of those same three issues, there's a lot that the ETMF will be able to do for you. In terms of quality, with an ETMF, you'll be able to better control what goes in and where the ETMF. You'll be able to reinforce document standards. You'll also have better control over QC processes through the use of workflows. In terms of completeness and reconciliation, while well, many documents are created directly within the system, and since documents become a key drivers of processes, you will be able to assess what is present in ETMF in real time. Also, uh, data related to each document can be used to build comprehensive dashboards, providing even more insights into your clinical trials in terms of metrics and KPIs. In terms of storage and accessibility, well, your ETMF requires hardly any room to store, really. So they, and data can be accessed from anywhere at any time almost instantly. You will also have better control over who can access what information and you'll be able to monitor it. A few do's and don'ts. So if you're uh, currently looking into moving to a ETMF from a paper TMF or a, reg or a normal TMF, uh, try thinking electronic, not paper, which means do not simply transpose your paper-based process into an electronic system because you'll, you'll be losing a lot of value that an electronic TMF will bring to you. Also. 
remember this uh, simple equation. So ETMF equals a classic TMF plus an EDMS plus a BPM for business process management plus BI, business intelligence. So you can do all this together with the use of a, a solid foundation in your ETMF. Remember this and think about the questions you want your ETMF to answer because knowing the questions your ETMF will, will need to answer will allow you to define better the type of uh, metadata each of your documents will need to be capturing. I also think about standardization to maximize the use of avail available industry standards and models. For instance, the DI ETMF reference model when you're creating your ETMF structure. This, in turn, will uh, increase maintainability, quality, potential for growth, and user acceptance of your newly deployed ETMF. Uh, now, what, what we'll be talking about today, so here's a quick overview of the presentation itself. Talk about transitioning to an efficient and agile system. We'll be presenting our building, uh, out, we can build an ETMF as a foundation for growth, agility, and performance. We'll present critical aspects of an ETMF and uh, an actionable counterpart, what we call the file plan. We'll explain in, in greater detail what that means. Uh, we'll talk, we'll show you how to define business process maps, metrics, and associated KPIs. Now, uh, for that specific subject, I, I will invite you to look at previous uh, presentations that were, that were uh, uploaded on our website as well on, on metrics and KPIs because we only have one hour, so we'll not go into a lot of detail there. Then we'll present a practical example illustrating the use of SharePoint as an ETMF for a clinical process management system. Then before we leave, we'll, present, we'll show you a few key functionalities uh, you should be looking uh, for when you're developing an ETMF solution. So to start, so here's three questions. What do we mean by an efficient and agile clinical management system? How can we make sure our system improves over time? And in all this, what role can the ETMF play? Now, we all know that, that we deal with very complex system and where all the following uh, items are true. So you're dealing with lots of documents. Uh, there's heavy regulation. You have a complex web of inter interdependent processes you have to deal with. Often those processes are not well defined or not well understood by everyone. There's still a, a very much an ingrained silos mentality, which makes it easier uh, to move from silo to, to silo, either information-wise or document-wise. Uh, there's still a strong paper, struck paper culture you might have to fight if you're going for an ETMF solution. And while you're trying to do this, you might also be facing cost reduction efforts. But uh, what we'll uh, show you a little bit later is uh, an ETMF effort would, of course, go end-to-end -end with cost reduction effort because by having an ETMF so complete solution, you would also have a much more efficient system. Now, uh, I just use that word, so efficient and agile. So what does efficient mean or agile? So efficient would be a minimum waste, both uh, in, time, in terms of time, resource, material, displacement, rework. Uh, you can think of the word uh, lean that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Then in terms of uh, optimal use of resources, which also be efficient, uh, reliable and predictable. So if you have a, a, an efficient system will also will often be defined and refined. So you will, in, in terms, will give you a more reliable and predictable behavior. Uh, with a reliable and predictable process, you, you have data that's collected in real time now will help you make decision or uh, implement contingency actions or make process adjustments as as those adjustments are needed. It will be able to act before um, before risks become actual issues and will also speed up your resolution process. Then uh, another point in, in terms of efficient system, if everything is defined and refined, then uh, you'll also be able to focus uh, changes or improvements in your system because you'll know where your bottlenecks are located and you'll know where you'll be able to, uh, to do minimum work for maximum impact. Uh, just a side note, when a system is properly defined and measured, bottlenecks are easily identified and true system improvements can be made as opposed to local improvements with marginal impacts on bottom line. In terms of agile, we're talking here adaptable, so easy to uh, 
uh, adjust your system based on the changes that constantly happen in your environment. So adding So I'm sorry, in terms of an agile system, we mean adaptable or easy to, to modify and improve. So here's the last note at the bottom. So having a lean system also improves agility because any excess resource, work, process, add to system complexity, make, making it harder for the system to adapt to its ever-changing environment. So what about an ETMF? How is this going to help me uh, get a more efficient and agile system? Well, um, first, like an ETMF will allow you to get rid of your Excel tracker. Uh, for the people in the industry, I'm sure um, that can be a little bit of a scary thought. But um, more importantly, your um, ETMF will become uh, your base upon which you're going to build a, a complete uh, electronic system. It will become central to a lot of very crucial operations. Uh, first, your ETMF would be central to performance monitoring because by cap capturing critical data, such as essential document information, we can get the clinical trial status in real time and potential risks can be more easily identified before they become true through issues. Then uh, your ETMF is also central to continuous improvement because by focusing improvements on high impact areas, uh, you'll have much more chance of being successful in into your improvement and you'll be able to generate a lot more substantial benefits. Uh, then your ETMF will also be central to, of course, business process management. You'll be able to better control the flow of artifacts through your system and which in turn will give you a better control over the trial itself. Uh, ETMF forms uh, the electronic baseline upon which business process management initiative can be undertaken. So what else will an ETMF improve? Here's a, a, a list, and it's not an exhaustive list because there are other benefits. But uh, of course, you'll have reduced costs. Uh, it's going to increase your standardization. It's going to facilitate the classification of your documents. It's going to facilitate the identification of the document because you could easily uh, auto-number your, your documents based on any combination of available metadata on the document. It will improve the traceability of your, of your trial. Uh, it'll provide global information access to anybody involved on a trial. Uh, it will facilitate and standardize data collection throughout um, the study. Um, it will uh, reduce work because now people won't have to waste time doing uh, work that's not really necessary, like work that the system can easily handle, like routing documents around, for instance. Uh, it will facilitate disaster recovery because everything is electronic, so you could have easily a database backed up in multiple places. Uh, it's going to increase team moral and sanity because it's going to facilitate collaboration and communication and also the, the ability to access information more easily. It's going to increase control throughout your operation, increase collaboration and compliance, of course, because um, quality will be instilled from the out onset when you're in, in entering a document in your ETMF, the quality will be verified right away so you know that if it makes it to your ETMF or your record center it's a quality document meeting minimum compliance requirements in terms of security speed quality I'd just like to talk a bit about eco-friendliness you won't have to waste all this paper right uh, printing on on paper documents you everything will be electronic so there's there's a good action for the environment and the list of course goes on so how do we build an ETMF as a foundation for growth, agility, and performance? So I'll give you uh, three key points. Now, now there are more, but these are uh, points I think should be respected. Um, so the, your ETMF should be built based on solid business-wide taxonomies in relation with document content types and the required metadata. So the taxonomy here um, is crucial, and we're not only talking about the taxonomy of the documents themselves, but the also the organization of the of your structure, of your trial structure, so that if, if you repeat a new trial, you don't need to reinvent that every time. The same structure gets deployed, and uh, you could have a person working on one trial and starting to work on another one, and it's going to be very familiar with this whole structure because it's going to be the same one repeating itself over and over again. 
So your ETMF system should be built to support operations and compliance. So there needs to be strong cohesion between where the information is generated, what we're calling, we'll call those work areas, and where the information is being stored, the ETMF itself. So there needs uh, to be cohesion between the, the, the work itself and where the work or the final product gets stored. The ETMF system should be designed, built and qualified with validation in mind every step of the way, not as an afterthought. If you build an ETMF and then uh, at the end of your ETMF project you decide to validate, it's, it could be very difficult and maybe you'll have forgotten about a very critical aspect of your, of your system. So always, it, whether you develop this solution in house or you ask for a vendor, to a vendor for it, uh, make sure yeah, it was done with validation in mind. In relation to these, so what do we mean by establishing a taxonomy standard? So remember that the GXP environment is very document centric, so everything gets documented. And if uh, you're a document centric organization, you'll require a business wide taxonomy standards to ensure consistency of, of information throughout. Uh, your taxonomy, as I said earlier, can be applied to list, subsite structures, content types, or columns, also called metadata in SharePoint. The taxonomy should be built from other available standards or model when possible, and uh, configuration specifications should be built based on the enterprise-wide taxonomy. Now, there's another webinar specifically on configuration specification that we've given in the past, so I, I would... Uh, I recommend you look into this if you're interested to hear more about configuration itself. Now, in terms of aligning your uh, your ETMF with your operations, here's a high-level view of uh, the uh, process structure or hierarchy in, within the uh, a typical uh, trial structure. So at the top level, we have uh, processes that may be at the program level. Uh, then we would have other processes at the trial, the region, the investigator site level, the investigator itself, and maybe at the subject level. You will have other processes that will uh, travel uh, vertically, if you will, from, say, a process that would um, group a regional and investigator site uh, uh, players. So uh, all of this to say that what, however your DMF is built, it should support that, that general hierarchy and it shall also support future processes that you'll want to develop and integrate with your ETMF. Now, uh, what is required for a compliance solution? So here I'm giving you a, a list of items to keep in mind if, if you want to um, have validation uh, included in your ETMF solution. In terms of documentation, uh, you should be using standard documentation for your solutions for so the typical URS, FS, and uh, CS documents should be present. In terms of configuration, whether the configuration of the ETMF solution should be packaged and controlled. Uh, that will include uh, all your SharePoint site collections, your content types, your columns, your list, and the various security aspects of your solution should be well documented and maintained. In terms of automation, uh, you'll need to define or predefine the workflows for the workspace you'll be uh, creating. In terms of components, so if you're using components, to uh, um, allow you to do other activities. Uh, they should also be defined, uh, for instance, the forms, the templates, if you're creating KPIs, dashboards, or if you're using web services. In terms of qualification, you'll, requ you'll require also to qualify any third-party application you'll be using. So if you're using another third-party solution for electronic signature or PDF generation, uh, those um, third-party applications should also be qualified uh, before uh, you can say that you have a validated environment. Then in terms of deployment, uh, think about the, the need to have installation qualification protocols and test scripts for your ETMF solution. In terms of validation, uh, that same solution should, should include a uh, validation plan and OQOQ protocols and test scripts to validate it. So in other words, like a, a complete uh, ETMF solution is not just uh, the technical deployment and implementation of, of the ETMF itself, but it's all the documentation that goes with it that often represents 50% uh, of the work itself, really. Now, some useful uh, standards and references 
uh, very briefly in, on those three points that we that we discussed together so in terms of taxonomy. I will um, recommend you taking a look at the DIA TMF reference model for it. In terms of business process management, when you come to uh, define your operations or your business processes, uh, there's standards available. Uh, you could use uh, BPMN from the OMG group. And in terms of validation, if you want to have a good guideline for validation of computerized system, of course, there's a GAM5 that's all also available. Now, the file plan, you heard me mention it earlier. So what is this and what is it used for? So the file plan allows the construction of a central taxonomy of all records. And now the, the file plan itself or this taxonomy will be used to create all document management structure for each department. It also allow to create content types and metadata for all of these documents. Uh, it will automatically classify and identify documents for you. It will allow you to determine document life cycles and it will also allow you to apply a specific PDF publishing templates. Now during the demonstration at the end of the presentation I'll show you what the file plan actually looks like and a little bit later here we'll talk about um, how it's used as well. But if we look at a file plan structure at the higher level you would have your zone that would be broken down then into your sections or subsection if need be that would that would later break down into your document types and for each document type within your file plan you might break it into multiple attributes some having to do with the classification of the document other uh, having to do with the routing of the document or the templates being used or the different types of appro approval needed or how the document will be numbered and you can see that in this list could grow on and on. If I give you a simple example of a if I come back on the zone section, document types, and the various attributes. So for the zone, you could have your study management files. Then that would break down into data management and protocols. And then if we go further down into your data management, uh, you could break it down into your data QC plan and your annotated CRF for uh, for document types. And if I look at the data QC plan and I, and I want to look at specific attributes for that data QC plan, I would have things to do, uh, if I look at routing, for instance, you have peer review uh, required, a yes, and regulatory review required, no, so you know how to route the document. There may be other things like AE signatures required on this document and so forth. The num numbering format is following the clinical uh, uh, template. Now, how does the file plan, uh, business process management, and ETMF interact together? So here's a simple diagram. Uh, at the top level we have a, to the top box here we have the file plan itself where all where your taxonomies, uh, document classification, the life cycle parameters and the publishing profiles of your documents are, are defined centrally. Now uh, each of your uh, work areas will, will have their own document structures, templates, content types and columns um, present in uh, SharePoint. So in this case you have department A and department B that you see which have their own work areas. Maybe document A could be documentation management, for instance. Doc department B uh, could be uh, technical operations, whatever you can imagine. Now what happens is that work is being performed within a uh, work area, in this case department A or department B, then you have the workflow engine that kicks in or, or work web services that kicks in to control, for instance, the document lifecycle process of document, uh, unique document numbering, document classification, and all these uh, various process that the document will need to go through for the people in the in the work areas to be able to do their work. Now, the workflow engine will also use the file bind to know how to route the document. But once all this work has been done, uh, what the workflow engine will do will take the the final record with all the metadata associated with it that could be specific information of the document or information having to do with the process itself, like who has approved the document and when. And now that record will be placed into the central file structure, which is your record center, which is also your ETMF, and, and then it will become the final record. Now this central file structure, of course, has uh, many regulatory requirements that, that pertains to it. And we're talking about audit trail, for instance, but there are others. And if you have any third-party application, they may be interacting at different levels. For the digital signature application, maybe 
it goes directly with your work area and then your workflow engine will communicate in this case to create submission ready PDFs so maybe with another third party engine now uh, for those of you who've worked uh, in SharePoint before you understand that, and if you've ever deployed an environment manually it's, it can be a very daunting task if you have a lot of content types and columns uh, I'm giving you an example here we have a SharePoint environment that's being deployed on top of, of other systems and that SharePoint environment as, as we've seen previously the, the workflows and web services are being deployed the work areas themselves are being deployed with all their columns and metadata and structure and subsite structure you have a record center that's also being deployed in the file plan itself all of this in SharePoint if you need to deploy manually it's going to be very difficult so the uh, the approach that I would recommend here is creating a design configuration workbook DCW that's um, control that's revision control and that's sponsor specific uh, what contains the the DCW well, it includes all the workspace structures so the names the libraries the list the columns the taxonomy like the term store and the hierarchies of all, of all your documents and the terms um, it will have uh, the TMF structure itself and the file plan structure itself for that specific sponsor and what happens in, in a good ETMF solution if you have a new trial that's being created then automatically uh, that whole structure gets deployed into SharePoint based on the design configuration workbook that you have that can be done very quickly even for my three to six hundred content types you have your your new uh, file plans your new study structure uh, created inside of SharePoint in 30 minutes or so um, so now we'll move a little bit about BPM and BI because as you um, create your ETMF solution your, your next step will be to start automating your processes and if you want to be successful at, at this critical step in, in improving your operation you might want to use uh, the BPM and BI principles so what is BPM and what is BI what are the essential business blocks uh, needed to create a BPM based system uh, we'll talk about this mystifying a little bit what is metrics and KPIs and more specifically how does it apply to clinical trial management first the definition of BPM there's a few here it depends uh, different groups have defined BPM differently but uh, mostly uh, business process management is a management approach focused on aligning all aspects of an organization it is also a holistic management approach that promotes business effectiveness and efficiency while striving for innovation flexibility and integration with technology and it is based on continuous improvement of processes we see a little picture on the right um, where BPM brings together if you will technology processes and resources what about business intelligence well uh, that's not a new concept even if the the word has became uh, became such a buzzword in the recent years in 1958 Hans Peter Loon a computer scientist at IBM used the term business intelligence for the first time defined intelligence as the ability to apprehend the interrelationships of presented facts in such a way as to guide action towards a desired goal and uh, this definition still applies today because the notion of intelligence is really to, to try to, if you will, extract information from the past to try to predict uh, the future a little better. There's uh, other definitions of BI that we found. Uh, BI refers to skills, processes, technologies, applications, and practices used to support decision making. BI technologies provide historical, current, and predictive views of a business operation. BI is composed on reports, dashboards, metrics, and analytical models. And BI is capable of transforming operational and business data into information and knowledge. And that's very important. So if we talk about the difference between uh, data, information, and knowledge quickly. So data is any uh, functional information you would be capturing in your system. It could be a date. It could be a value at any specific point. And then what is information? Information is in a system is generally the answer to a question. 
So if you can ask a question to your, your system, so when was this document submitted, and you can find the answer with a specific set of data, then really you transform your data into information. And what is knowledge? Well, it's the accumulation of information into building a comprehensive set of, of understanding. So you, when you start understanding the relationship between um, in your system, and then you can predict it, how it will behave better. Um, one critical aspect of, of building a, a strong BPM uh, system, you'll need to identify data sources and integration points throughout your system um, because that's what this is what's going to allow you to, to build uh, KPIs on milestone that will be relevant to your operation. Uh, data sources for KPIs and milestones can come from different sources. Um, documents and document metadata that can be used, procedures and procedural data coming from workflows can be used. It could come from other database too, so it's not because your ETMF can be used to capture and analyze data that the only data you should be anal analyzing should come from that system. You can also pull information from your EDC, your CTMS of other other safety system or whatever you have at your disposition. But you also have to remember that data can be entered manually. It's perfectly uh, acceptable to have manually generated metrics as long as you have a standard way to, to capture and enter the information. When thinking about data for KPIs and milestone, it's also important to identify unique data sources. So it's data can come from different sources, but for a specific data point, uh, you sh your data source should always be the same. There's also you know, so think about establishment and use of standards as a key to be able to in integrate your data sources. So think procedure, think repeatable, think repeatable in this way. Um, you should have a much better outcome on your KPIs and metrics over time. How do we go about identifying uh, KPIs? Well, for first, what are KPIs? So KPIs are key operational indicators which are measured using information from processes, data, and documents as we've seen earlier. KPIs are, can be calculated or not calculated values based on one or many data points. KPIs can also be drilled in to see underlying KPIs and data are rolled up to see higher level KPIs. So the, there's a hierarchy of your KPIs. So it's important that your KPIs mesh together because you don't want to have uh, two sets of metrics opposing each other because that will create additional conflict within your organization. Uh, example of KPIs uh, could be a time between first subject, first visit, and the database lock at the study level. It could be your time between last query and database lock at the study level or time to query resolution. It really depends what's critical to your specific environment. What, uh, here's a simplified three-step approach to defining KPIs. So first, you'll have to define your common goal and metrics cross-functionally, so from end to end. And then think about generating a business-wide business -wide understanding of your processes and priority. So there should be some level of process definition already in place so that people can, can share a common understanding of what is important for successful trial completion. Then once you have that, you can start uh, engineering your KPIs to support the goal and promote continuous improvement of your system. Here's a, an, an example of a critical milestones map in relation to a trial. I'm not sure if we can see, but I'd like to point to the fact that it's broken down into the same levels we saw earlier on. So at the top level, like the green line, would be program uh, level milestones. And then uh, if you go one step lower, we have more uh, regional, if you will, or, or tri no, I'm sorry, the blue line would be a trial level milestone. And then if you go down, we have regional level milestones. And then if we go one level lower, we have site level milestone. And we have finally purple subject level milestones. Now, if we take, uh, these are all dates uh, that a, a specific document or deliverable would have changed status. So if you take any of those uh, dates and we subtract one from the other, we get the actual number of days between two milestones. Well, that number of days 
can then be transferred into a KPI. So I want to know, for instance, how long does it take me to get my protocol synopsis approved after my IB has been approved? Well, that specific period of time can be a metric or a KPI. And, but before I can do that, I need to define my critical milestones. So I needed to know that my IB uh, approved date and my IB approval date and my protocol synopsis approval date were critical dates. So the first step really is define your your milestone map. Once you have your milestone map, define your, your key metrics, so KPIs, and then start improving your processes. So what is at your disposal in SharePoint to be able uh, to build a, a complete solution? So you have, well first, before you get into SharePoint, you should talk, think about creating your own process maps internally. And there's different adaptation uh, available to you. We've talked about BPM and earlier on. There's also ISO and there's plenty more. So once you have a specific process defined, then you can use uh, the SharePoint tools at your disposition to really create the environment where you can manage that process. You can build it from workspaces, you can use workflows, lists, forms, etc. Um, then you also have the possibility to create scorecards and dashboards that will report um, the information in real time on the status of that process. If you're uh, in terms of clinical study management, uh, remember once again when you're building those scorecards, the data can come from many various systems to build it, and then you can pull it out into a central view, like we've seen uh, on this page. You have a central score scorecard where information comes from the CTMS, the EDC, uh, the workflow server, your EDMS, and your R IVRS system. It could look something like this. This is a, an old uh, older scorecard that was built using SharePoint 2007. We'll see a, a more recent one during the demo, but you can see on this view that a lot of information comes uh, well jumps at you uh, quite quickly. You have the you can see that the average days to first subject first visit is usually a six, successful um, process, while because uh, everything is pretty much green. While if we look at the average days to ISF completion, we might have a little bit more trouble especially in the United States and in France. So what you see on the left side here on the column are the studies themselves. And then you have countries, and each country is broken down with the sites that are actually participating to the study. And then on, on the axis here, you have the different KPIs, and they are the measures themselves. So it gives you a really quick view of what's going on with your study. Now, we'll get into the demonstration, uh, but before we get into the demo, uh, we are talking about before uh, you build your ETMF, think about the sort of questions you'll want to ask to it so that you know uh, what data you'll want to capture. Uh, some typical question you might be wanting to ask, uh, what is the review stage of a specific document? Is uh, site uh, X ready for IP site release? Uh, I might be wondering if a monitoring activity was compliant with the applicable SOP. Were the following visit delays acceptable, like the time to conduct a visit, the time between visit execution and report creation, the time to get visit report reviewed and approved? Well, I will um, get into the uh, demo right now. So, so we'll start with a bit of a system overview. So here's, for those who have, of you who have never seen the SharePoint environment or the SharePoint 2010. This is a, a very drab one. We haven't done any specific configuration on the look of it. But um, quickly, uh, at the top level, you have different uh, sub-site structures. So we broke the area into the general admin, clinical operation, data management, biostats, regulatory, IVRS quality. And here you have the records themselves, which is your actual uh, ETMF. So all of these are work areas as we talked before, and this one here would be the work at center. And and what you see here, every one of those line items are actual documents. If they've been sent to the record center, you have an hyperlink that's left behind, so you can still access the document, but the actual source document is now 
in the record centered because it is a, now a record. Uh, you can see also that uh, the structure is broken down by study and these are these studies have different folders for the various area and then subfolder structure. So these are my various lists inside my library. I have my different different work areas as I talked about and I can reorganize this and here I'm, is my ETMF. Now it's really easy to customize different views in this structure. Uh, for instance, we were asking oh, is a specific site ready for IP site release? Well, I'm in my site management folder here and I'm going to access a view that I call my uh, document by site view. If I look for a specific site, well first they're organized by country. If I know that it's in Poland, it's my site 1084. Well, I have documents that are ready for this site. So I only have one of them that's now a record, which, and I know usually for IP series I'll probably need something like 10 documents. Uh, so I'm really far from being ready. But eventually what you'll do, once you have a automated your IP site release process, uh, you can have the system automatically track the status of the necessary documents so when the proper document status has, has been reached, then a notification could be sent so you don't have to monitor this on a daily basis to know where you're at. Now if I, I wanted to also um, give you a look of what the file plan might look. So this is an actual file plan we can see it's essentially a SharePoint list, but this is a central list that will be used as we talked about earlier to do uh, document routing and, and uh, classification and, and, and so forth. We see we have a reference here to the document code, so that could be used to number the document if we wanted to. We also have reference to whether or not the document is auditable, submittable, and so forth. If uh, IRB, IEC is needed on this document, um, another interesting portion so you see the the reference to the um, sorry to the to the DIA reference model name so if you if your organization has a different name for it you could track it in this document so you can if the DIA reference model changes you could always track the change to your own internal structure also if we look at the uh, ICH E6 section if you have a regulation that's changed and, and it's affecting one of your documents well, if you know that the reg regulation has changed, you could easily look for that specific. Oh, sorry, just lost my. Well, the system is slow today. Okay. So. If I look at my section, these were, I, I filtered up by mistake. So if I want to look at this portion and I want to know which documents will be affected now that my, that section 2.2 has changed or I could possibly be affected, then I know right away that, okay, my trial management plan may be affected by that change in, in regulation, so it's, it speeds up uh, any sort of impact assessment I would have to conduct based on regulatory changes. Well, you can see how like this file plan could be used for multiple things. It's also a specifier, as I said, like how the number, how the documents should be numbered and they specify the routing. So if I have, if, if I have a, say a DLP process that's automated, and I have a regulatory review required yes no column then my my uh, DLP process can look into this specific uh, file plan to know if he needs to send it for regulatory approval before sending it to document management uh, before the document can be placed into the record center. Now um, if I look at if I go back to my uh, site management if you want to know also the like the status of a specific document, it's really easy because now you, it's a metadata column, so you're always going to have the actual value of the metadata. So I know that this document here 
is currently under peer review. I know that this document has been final file, so it's currently in the ETMF structure, etc. For those of you, if, if you want to, um, to use uh, also Excel to do some analysis, it's also possible. You can easily uh, extract uh, uh, this all information into Excel if you want to, even in a pivot table. What I'll do here, I would go, sorry. I'll change the view to have an all document view. So I can take all the document inside that library. And then if I want to get this into a data sheet view, it's possible. And if I want to export that information into, a, let's say, a pivot table in Excel, so I can analyze the data, it's very easy. Now I have, I can grab, so I want to know, um, okay, this is my total number of documents. I have the count of document. I want to know by document status. I can tell for that study that I have currently in this in this folder structure, 14 documents, two of which are management review, five of which are final five, four of which are peer review, and et cetera. And you can build very uh, useful uh, reports in Excel if you know how to use a pivot tables and pivot graphs. I'm not going to go into the detail because that's uh, not the uh, point of this presentation here. Uh, but lastly, when, uh, maybe another item we talked about earlier as well. In terms of site management, if you want to know, uh, we want to verify compliance for to a specific SOP. We talked about a specific portion of site monitoring being measured. Well, in Excel, it's pretty easy to to, uh, I mean, not in Excel, sorry, in SharePoint, it's pretty easy to create columns that would be calculated columns. I created one here that's called submission delays and days. So, and then there's another one with the approval delays and days for each of these documents. And those are based on the approval date and the creation date of the documents. So I can quickly browse through and figure out those that are exceeding a certain value. I could also put an alert in the system to let me know if certain value exceeds a certain threshold. Now, um, if I want to look into what a dashboard may look in 2010, this is a dashboard that was built. Uh, there's three studies here. And the uh, we look, if you remember, we talked about KPIs, like being able to drill in and drill out into KPIs. So here I have my three studies. I have two views, two different levels, both site management, but one site management view at the study level and I have a site management view at the site level. Now just to isolate the data a bit, I'm just going to use study 103. Now the system will filter the information for me. Um, for study, well, at the study level under site management for study 103, I have four high level KPIs, so site specific CTP management, overall site opening duration, overall site execution duration, and overall site closing duration. And you can see the number of days here in the variance and the status of the KPI, so green being good, yellow being uh, be careful, and red usually meaning being bad. If I open my site opening duration, then it's broken down into sub-level KPI, one for site contract development, one for site qualification, and one for site initiation. And together, they add to my overall site opening duration. So that's what we meant by having a higher level KPI that can be broken down into lower, lower level KPIs. So there, there's a hierarchy, if you will. Now, here, I have the same information, but visualized differently for site level. So I have my lower level KPIs on that axis here. And then on the other axis, I have my actual sites uh, divided by region and by studies so that I can roll in or roll out. If I want to know information about just uh, the American sites for that specific study, so they've been filtered out, I can see I, I seem to have problems closing my site. 
However, my site qualification is usually doing very well. So it's a very quick way to get information, and, and those can be populated in real time so you can see the progress of your study. And it, as uh, you see KPIs going into the red or going into yellow, then you can act upon it either uh, through a monitoring visit or just figure out why um, the delays are starting to exceed the values we're looking for. So that sums up um, uh, the material I had for you today in terms of a demo. So before we close, just like to uh, give you a, some uh, key as aspects uh, that that you be you should be looking for for an ETMF. So remember that your ETMF needs to be built on a robust taxonomy based on industry best practices, and the ability to adapt to changing needs. So you want your ETMF to be agile because regulatory changes will happen all the time. You'll need to put corrective actions in place. You'll have new automated processes, etc. So you want to be able to um, improve your ETMF over time. Your ETMF should also allow you to the auto generation of a study structure. We've seen this, so uh, you want you don't want to have to deploy an ETMF manually every time. So all workspaces, your list, your libraries, your columns, your workflow, all of this should be deployed automatically based on a version controlled DCW. Then uh, it should support process-based routing uh, based on the file plan information. And the data capture should also be based on your file plan information. This way you only have one version of the truth, and that's the file plan that dictates what should happen in terms of information capture. In terms of auto-identification uh, of documents it should also be based on your version controlled file plan. Uh, your, file, your, your ETMF should allow you to auto file uh, ETMF ready documents into record center from your work area. It's not a, a process that you should have to do manually when, when a record is deemed uh, approved and ready to be filed in your ETMF. Your system uh, should recognize that status moving directly into your ETMF structure and then apply um, the rules or your business rule that needs to be applied to that specific document, not that it is a record. Uh, you should also have real-time dashboards available to you to be able to build uh, uh, business scorecards, KPIs, any types of graphs that may be valuable to you. Uh, it should be easily accessible and managed through a web interface so, because you want people to be able to access it from anywhere at any time, even using uh, intelligent phones if needs be. And then it should, of course, be validation ready. So um, think of the documentation as part of the solution. So the URS, FS, DS, your test scripts, all those validation documents that will eventually allow you to be able to use your ETMF are a necessary part of the solution. Uh, before I leave, I'd like to invite you on to our next webinars. Uh, the next one will be on integrating system and change management for regulated life sciences application using SharePoint. Uh, this webinar will be held on July 11th and July 25th uh, between 11 and 12 Eastern Time. Uh, before I leave, uh, I want to thank you for listening to me. And then um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to call or email me at, at the uh, phone number or the email address that you're seeing below. And if you want more information about Montreal, you could always check our website at, at www.montreal.com. Thank you.